In September 2015, a hiker in Canberra, Australia, came across a very odd sighting in the middle of nowhere. He had just crested a hill, and in front of him, he sees this. Now, I don't know about you and how brave you are, but when I'm in the back country, if I see something weird, I'm booking it out of there. I'm bouncing out. I'm not hanging out because I'm not about to be the one that dies doing something dumb out there. And this thing looks like some, I don't know, mushroom on legs. And I'm not going to be the guy who dies at the hand of some toxic walking fungi, okay? So, but this hiker, he's brave enough. He walks up and approaches this odd-looking creature and sees it from another angle. And lo and behold, it's a sheep. It's a sheep. What? What is a sheep doing out here in the middle of nowhere? There's no shepherd. There's no flock. This thing is all alone in the middle of nowhere. And by looking at it, it was in pretty dire straits. Its wool had overgrown so much, you couldn't even see. It's kind of like that phase that all boys go through in high school when they had the shaggy hair. You know what I'm talking about, right? We've all been there, okay? But its wool was just so heavy on its body that it was nearly immobilized, could barely bend down to eat. And it was clear to the person who found it that it was probably disease-ridden. It looked very sickly. Had, it was tormented by bugs and parasites. And so, understandably, this hiker runs back down the mountain to get this sheep some help and begins contacting some agencies, finally gets in contact with the Royal SPCA. And they come out and they extract the sheep. They begin looking for uh, who this shepherd could be of this sheep. They, they contact local shepherds and they eventually find the shepherd. And the shepherd tells them, oh, that's Chris. Chris the sheep. He's been missing for six years. Six years he's been on the lamb, literally. This dude hated being in the pastures that his shepherd provided for him. He, his, his shepherd provided safe, protected pastures full of lush green grass with a stream right through the middle of it. And Chris wanted what was on the other side of the fence, right? He'd poke his head through, shove his body through the barbed wire fence until he escaped. And he was known to constantly be an escape artist. He was like a fluffy Houdini. And eventually, six years prior to him being found, he escaped for good. And he ended up in a very dangerous predicament and near death because he didn't want to be led by a shepherd. Today, we're going to continue our series, Psalm 23, and we're going to look at specifically just verse 2. And the question I want to wrestle with today, what I want us to be thinking through is, where are you seeking rest for your soul? Where are you seeking rest for your soul? You see, we are bombarded by things in the world that want to rob us of rest, right? This is the reason why when we're at home and we should be resting with our family, we're answering work emails or phone calls or text messages or voicemails or, or school, right? I'm pretty sure finals week is just a, a scheme of Satan to rob teenagers and college students of their rest, right? They're just exhausted during this exams and, and homework, past due assignments, or maybe the worries and the thing that robs you of your rest is those interpersonal relationships, worried about your marriage, you're worried about your kids, you're worried about your friend circle, or maybe you're experiencing guilt or shame. All of these things want to rob us of our rest. And if we don't have a deeper seated place to go to experience rest, we will live life exhausted, burnt out and burnt up. And so today, I want us to wrestle with this idea. Where are we going to find rest for our souls? And maybe that's not a question you've ever thought of before. You think of physical rest, you know how to do that. Maybe mental rest, you know how to do that. Where do we turn to to find rest for our souls? It's just as important. And I believe it's the tipping point for the other two. So it's Psalm 23, starting in verse 2, it goes like this. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. This epic picture here of this serene, beautiful, peaceful place. The first thing I want to pull out of this is that the good shepherd knows his sheep. He knows his sheep. Let's look at it again. It says, he makes me lie down in green pastures and he leads me beside still waters. Last week, Pastor Paul spoke on the Lord is my shepherd. 
There's a, a personal relationship that has been bought for us in Christ. Which is, this is an area of theology that just frankly amazes me. The cosmic God of the universe, all powerful, almighty, spoke everything into existence, parted the Red Sea, raises the dead, rescues guilty sinners and makes them grateful children. That same God wants to be intimately involved in your life. He knows you. He knows how many hairs are on your head. I got a lot of hair here, okay? He's got a lot of counting to do, but he knows you intimately. That's good news. And we can rest in that because he knows what we need and he provides what we need. You see, I think you and I, we kind of get it twisted between our wants and our needs. Sometimes we feel like our wants are needs, right? I want a bigger paycheck so I can have a bigger house and a nicer car and a more comfortable lifestyle. God doesn't promise to provide for our wants, but he knows us intimately as this verse indicates, and he provides for our needs. He says it this way in uh, Matthew 6. Matthew 6, starting in verse 25, says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and that your heavenly Father feeds them. He says, like, there's things that we fret about that rob us of our rest. We worry and we, we frantic to provide for ourselves. God knows what we need and he provides for us just as he does to the animals, to the birds of the air. And he goes on. Are you not of more value than they? Amen. We're more valuable than pigeons, guys. That's awesome, right? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour of, to his lifespan? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. He talks about King Solomon, who was one of the wisest people to ever live, had all kinds of riches, had everything that he could ever dream of. And he says, if you look out at a meadow and see how God clothes that with beautiful flowers and green grass, Solomon didn't even compare. God knows what you need and he provides. He continues on. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious saying, what should we eat or what should we drink or what should we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. God knows you intimately. He knows what you need. He wants to be your provider of exactly what you need. And I think sometimes we, we know that God knows us, right? We know that God knows his people, but it's hard for us often to believe that God knows me intimately. The God, this cosmic God of the universe knows me as a person. That's what Jesus purchased for us on the cross, a personal relationship. It wasn't just a collective buy. It was a personal relationship that he purchased on the cross. And we can rest. Because God knows your needs and he's going to provide for you. Are you experiencing rest because of your personal relationship with God? Or do you relate more to the anxiety in those verses of what am I going to eat? What am I going to drink? What if, what if, what if, what if, what if? Anxiety wants to rob your rest from you. The next thing I want us to look at in this passage of Psalm 23, 2 is that the good shepherd gives rest to his sheep. Let's look at it again. It says, he makes me lie down in green pastures and he leads me beside still waters. And I do want to pause for a moment. This verse and the promise therein is not saying that if I follow Jesus, every day is going to be great. It's not saying that we will always walk in green pastures and we will always be beside still waters because the next verse says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. This verse is one side of a double-sided coin. There are days where we walk in green, lush pastures, those peaceful moments. Maybe for you, it's in, in the wilderness. You're out there and you're just looking at God's amazing creation. 
or, or those moments where uh, you get to reflect and relax on vacation or maybe on, on Christmas holiday with your family in the living room, just hanging out, loving each other. I know for some of us, that's not exactly restful, but, but there are those moments of rest. And then there are moments where every one of us will walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And the promise of this verse is not if you follow God, everything will go well for you. The promise of this verse is that despite the circumstances in your life, there is a deeper place to go for rest. Because God's rest is not constrained by circumstance. You can have chaos going on around you. And yet in Jesus, my soul can have rest. And this picture of a shepherd with his sheep, Sheep are notoriously untrusting animals. They just, they don't trust. They're constantly terrified and they need the presence of their shepherd at all times to make sure that they're, they're gonna be safe. Otherwise they don't feel comfortable. It takes four things for a sheep to actually want to lie down because otherwise they're afraid that they may be vulnerable. The first one is there can't be any tensions in the flock. Right? They're not going to lie down if they're going to need to throw down, okay? They're not going to lie down on the ground if another sheep's going to come up and headbutt them, all right? So they need to know that there's no tension in the flock. They also need to know that they're provi- provided for. They need to know that the shepherd has provided a place that has not just enough food for them individually, but for the flock as a whole, so they'll get their share. That the shepherd has provided a place of, uh, where they can get their water. They need to feel like the shepherd has everything that they need provided for them. And sheep also need to feel as though they're protected from the torment of insects, that the shepherd is, is lovingly caring for his sheep. And a shepherd would pour oil on the sheep's head. And we'll get into that later in this Psalm, what that means specifically, but it would keep the bugs out of their ears and out of their nose. And so this is a picture of the shepherd gently caring for the sheep in an intimate way. But the most important one, I believe, as they needed the presence of their shepherd to protect them from predators, to protect them from enemies. And Jesus himself actually spoke to this issue. John 10, Jesus, he talked about himself as the good shepherd. He said, I am the good shepherd. I believe this is a reference back. Hey guys, remember Psalm 23 where David's talking about God's his shepherd? That's me. That's this who I am. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is not a hired hand and not a she- or he who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. So there's this kind of a picture or a parable of a shepherd, his sheep, and this hired hand. And the shepherd's away. We don't know what the shepherd is doing, but he's hired somebody to care for his flock. And it says, when the hired hand sees that predator coming, when he sees that wolf coming, he bounces out. There's no way I'm going to put skin in the game. I'm not going to die for these sheep. I don't even care about them. This is a summer job. Like, I'm just here to save money for college. He's out of here. Look at what Jesus says about himself. He's not like the hired hand. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Remember, the good shepherd knows his sheep. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. He says, look, if there's a predator coming, you got to go through me, bro. Like, these are my sheep. I care for them. I'm going to protect them. You're not getting through me. And this is amazing news for you and I, because the reality is, is we have a, a, a predator, an enemy of our soul that's far greater than a wolf. His name is Satan. And his job is to steal, kill, and destroy. He hates you and he hates God. And Jesus defeated him on the cross. He may walk around like a roaring lion, but he's been defanged and declawed. Jesus, on the cross, he took the penalty that you and I rightly deserve. And then then God's wrath was poured out on him. And on the cross... Jesus overcame Satan, he overcame death, and he overcame sin. And now you and I are presented to God as righteous. And we went through this extensively in our gospel series, the last series we were just in. If you've not got to watch that or you were gone for whatever reason, 
Please go back and review that. that we, we expanded on the gospel extensively. This is the good news that the shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He says, I'm the good shepherd. Nothing's getting to my sheep. I'm protecting them. They're, they're under my watch. And I have already bought their freedom. I've already bought their hope. I've bought their security that they are God's and nothing's going to change that. But I'm afraid far too often you and I both look to other places for security, rest, and peace. Right? It's, a, it's been a hard day at work or a hard day at school. And, and so to distract ourselves, we come home and we binge watch all, all the seasons of Friends or or you play video games until your eyes bleed. Or, or maybe you, you turn to a drink. Or maybe you turn to sex. Or maybe, maybe to distract yourself from the worry that's robbing you of your rest, you, you busy your schedule so that you have so much going on you can't even think about it. We turn to these false offers of rest. And I just want to say, nothing is wrong with those things. There's nothing wrong with Netflix. There's nothing wrong with, with playing video games. What I am saying is if we're turning to those to find rest for our souls, we will always be exhausted. Because that's a distraction. That's a, that may be an escape. In some cases, it may be numbing. It's not rest. There's only one place we can go to to find rest for our souls. And his name is Jesus. And Jesus did not die so that you and I could live spiritually exhausted. He wants us to be a, a, a people to have streams of living water, living in, in lush places in our soul. He wants us to be refreshed and renewed. He wants us to have rest. He wants to lead us into restful places. Where are you seeking rest for your soul? Are you just distracting yourself from the worry? Are you numbing? Jesus in Matthew 11 says this. He says, don't go to all those false places. He says, come to me, all who are weary and burdened. This is a call to anybody who will listen, anybody who will come. He says, come to me if you're weary. Weary is, is when we're overworked and underrested, right? When we're striving and straining and moving forward and exhausted and overly busy. And then the burdens here are things that others place on us. He says, whether you're weary or burdened, maybe you have, you know, a job with, with unrealistic, unrealistic expectations on you. Or, or there are people in your life that have unrealistic expectations on you and they keep burdens on you. Jesus says, your soul can find rest here. Come to me. You can't find it in all these other places. You can find it in me. And he continues and he tells us how. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, a yoke is not really a common picture nowadays, but back then what they would do is they would yoke together two animals, usually oxen, when they were plowing a field. And what they would do, it kind of looked like this. They yoke two, a, a yoke is like a, a wooden piece of uh, a bar across the animals. And they'd yoke an experienced and stronger oxen with an inexperienced and weaker oxen. And the stronger oxen, would, he knew the game. This is what we're doing. We're moving forward. We're going this way. And the younger, less experienced oxen would, would buck against it and try and fight it and, and wrestle with it until he learned to walk with the other ox. And when I first heard this verse, I thought of myself as the one carrying the, the yoke and Jesus behind me kind of directing and guiding me, maybe poking and prodding me at times. Maybe sometimes he hasn't cracked the whip. That, that was my perspective. That's not what Jesus says here. He says, take my yoke. For my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. You see, Jesus is that more experienced, stronger ox there. And when we come alongside him and allow him to be there with us in the midst of our weariness and our burden, that's where we find rest. 
Jesus is the one plodding along saying, this is the way we're going. Trust me, follow me. And he's gracious to us, whether or not we follow or we're bucking against the yoke. But he says, come to me. You're not going to find rest for your souls anywhere else. You can only find it here. Are you experiencing rest? Or are you frantic and exhausted? The last thing I want us to see in this passage is that the good shepherd leads his sheep. He leads his sheep. Psalm 23, 2, again says, the second half of it, he leads me beside still waters. This requires trust, right? This requires a a level of, I don't know where we're going and it looks scary, but I'm gonna follow you because you're the shepherd and you know better than I do. But how, how, how often are we more like Chris the sheep? Who though the shepherd has provided everything we need, We jump the fence because the grass looks greener on the other side and we go our own way, ending up in a dangerous predicament. Here's the question. Are you following Jesus? Not perfectly. Nobody's there. But are you following Jesus? He is that stronger oxen. And are you walking with him through life, even in the wearisome trials? Or are you more like that younger ox that bucks against the system and and tries to escape and find their own way? Because that's a very exhausting way to live. You won't find rest. You can't find rest apart from Christ. Are you following Jesus? And here's, I just want to pause for a moment. What's the one thing in your life right now that you know God has called you to do that you've either ignored or outright disobeyed? I don't want anybody to leave with shame. I do want you to leave knowing how to rest. And part of rest is allowing Jesus to lead your life. What's that thing that God has been pressing on your heart? The Holy Spirit's been convicting you. You see it in scripture and yet it's not happening in your life. God wants to give you the grace and the power to change that. If only you'd stop bucking against the yoke, submit and follow Jesus in that area. Are you following Jesus? And maybe you're here today and you've never made that decision. I can promise you, you will not find rest for your souls anywhere else in the world other than Christ. My son, uh, we go hiking often. And when I was, uh, it was a couple years ago, we went hiking up at Shadow Falls out Glide with the Ketchum family from the Green Campus. And we have a rule when we go hiking because there is real dangers out there. There's predators and there's cliffs and jagged rocks. And so um, he's a little barbarian. He loves to trailblaze ahead. And we have a rule. If I can't see you, you're in the wrong place. Let daddy lead. If there's something that's dangerous, I will let you guys know and we'll take care of it. Well, my son has completely thrown that rule out the window on this particular hike. And he's running a couple hundred yards ahead of me. And he's went around a curve that I can't see him. I have no idea where he is. And so uh, I'm about to call out to him to tell him, hey, stop, wait for the rest of the family to catch up with you. When I hear a cat, it's not a kitty cat. It was a cougar up on top of a rock bluff, snarling and hissing and scratching at the ground, making every bit of noise that it could to let us know it's not happy about our presence. And I, I, and I ran up to Asher and I said, dude, you're not safe. You need to come back here. We never could see the cougar. We could just hear it. But we knew he wasn't safe. You see, with dad, there's safety. I had things to protect us from the predator. But he had decided to go on his own lead himself, and he ended up in a very dangerous situation. Are you allowing Jesus to lead you, 
Or have you, like my son, ran ahead and said, I'm going to figure it out on my own? God wants to lead you. And are you trusting him to lead you? He wants to lead you to rest. Are you trusting him to lead you to rest? I have to admit that um, this idea of rest has been really hard for me in the last week. Um, it's amazing. We're, we're opening a new building and it's, it's awesome. Like I'm super excited about it. Uh, South Umpqua is going to have a permanent home for our church family. It's awesome. But there's a lot of work that goes into that. And the team that has been working behind the scenes to get all this done is an amazing team. But with any construction project, there's problems. Problems arise, delays happen. And so I walk into the church on Tuesday, and this is what the front entryway looks like. Total mess, right? There's wood everywhere, garbage, cardboard boxes. I move into the, uh, the classrooms, and they're full of just debris that we had to put in there and get out of our old location. I move into the auditorium, and it's a disaster area, right? There's like no place for people to sit. And then I go into the bathrooms, and we have a bathroom. We just don't have a toilet. <laughs> and my heart just began to seize with anxiety. It just began to fill my mind. And I'm thinking, on top of getting all of this stuff together, I'm preaching this weekend, and I love to teach, but I have a lot of responsibility on me, and it feels like I can't get it done. And so on, on Tuesday evening, I went up to uh, a little ways up north to get some rest and, and th work through the message. And on my way home, I'm so exhausted, physically, mentally, spiritually, that I actually fall asleep on the freeway right before the exit to Myrtle Creek. And it was like a split second. I fell asleep, I hit the bumpers, and then I woke back up. I pulled off the freeway at Myrtle Creek, and I just began praying, God, what is going on with me? Like, where, why, why am I not resting? And I realized I'm not resting because I'm not trusting God. See, there's this massive task in front of me and I feel like I have to do it all on my own. I'm not trusting God to bring other people alongside of me. I'm not trusting God to work behind the scenes and get things done. You see, I believed this is Jesus' church, but Jason has to build it. If we're not resting, we're not trusting God. And I, I just want to say there, there has been this idea that it's a badge of honor to live your life over busy, overworked, and underrested, and that is not what God has called his people to. Jesus died that we could have rest for our souls, connection with the Father. Are you experiencing rest? And this is a crucial thing that is very pressing, or, or will never be pressing, rather. It's a crucial thing that will never, there's never going to be a deadline on your calendar for rest. But it is crucial because if we're not resting, we will be ineffective for the gospel. The gospel is the most amazing, beautiful, awesome, um, powerful thing in the world. That God humbled himself to become a man and die for guilty sinners. Like that's amazing truth. And you and I, if we're not resting, we will be ineffective in sharing that. Rest is crucial to the mission of God. It's trusting that God is doing his mission even when I'm resting at home or with my family. It's an act of worship. I trust you, God. I'm going to rest like you've asked me to do, and I trust you to continue doing your work. It's crucial to the gospel. Without rest, we will be exhausted, beat down, and ineffective. And we will reflect to the world that a relationship with God is more like a taskmaster with slaves than a loving father with his children. Are you experiencing rest? I'm going to release to the campuses. I love you guys. 